All right, welcome tonight to our web series, The Future of EMS. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about helicopter emergency medicine, uh, emergency medical services uh, with uh, Dr. Ryan Newberry. I'm your host, uh, Dr. Brian Everett. I'm the chair elect uh, for the EMS section with AEM. We are going to get started here in a second if I can stop sharing my screen. There we go. All right. So tonight's uh, presentation is doc done by Dr. Newberry. He's a native of Northwest Illinois and was a firefighter paramedic for the Freeport and Illinois uh, Rockford, Illinois Fire Departments. Uh, he started his career in HIMSS uh, medicine as a critical care flight paramedic with OSF uh, Lifeline helicopter uh, before attending the Col Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine as a US Army commissioned officer. He then went on to graduate from the San Antonio Uniform Services Health Education Consortium uh, in the emergency medicine residency at Burke Army Medical Center. Uh, he then completed a fellowship in EMS and disaster medicine, where he was awarded a master's in public health. He was the first American to complete both a flight physician secondman, which is a fellowship with the world-renowned uh, London Air Ambulance in London, uh, the city of London, England, and the United Kingdom uh, Medical Emergency Response Team uh, or UK MERT uh, selection course. I spent several years over there working with that, or spent a year over there working with this uh, uh, elite team. Uh, he's also a combat veteran. Uh, he completed several deployments with the US Army forward resuscitation and surgical teams and a tour with the British Army. Uh, he holds both a board certification in both uh, emergency medicine and EMS. He has experience working in both the community and academic center. He maintains a strong interest in pre-hospital medicine uh, throughout his military career. He was the medical uh, program director of the uh, Military EMS Disaster Fellowship at San Antonio and associate medical director with UT Health uh, Emergency Health Science Office of the Medical Director and San Antonio Fire Department. He's been doing that since 2016. His research interests include advanced trauma procedures, uh, particularly pre-hospital thoracotomies, uh, cardiac arrest resuscitation, damage control resuscitation, and mass casualty incident response. He currently works uh, clinically as the EMS physician and emergency physician at uh, Bree Bay Walsh Emergency Department at UW Health and as a flight physician with UW Health Medit Flight. Thank you, Dr. Newberry, for coming to teach us tonight about integration of EMS physicians into HEMS and how the future of HEMS depends on the EMS physician led teams. I'll turn it over to you to get started and thank you again for coming tonight. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. So, Thank you for the, the very nice introduction. Um, really just had a lot of really good mentors in all those different places. So today, uh, just wanna briefly just touch on the history of USMs, the major problems that are kind of facing our industry and then where the pre-hospital physician fits into all of it. All of these could be, you know, or some of these actually were like grand, uh, grand rounds level talks of their own. So uh, we're gonna keep it as the 30,000 foot view. Uh, just before we go, just two people uh, that I do need to recognize for. So on the left is Dr. Mike Abernathy. Mike's been a flight physician for over 35 years. He was actually my first medical director as a flight paramedic. Now he's a colleague here at UW Health, and he's been mentoring me for about 20 years. And then on the right is Dr. Drew Cathers. He's uh, been a mentor of mine for about four years. He's the medical director for MedFlight. And both of them had a substantial contribution in putting this uh, together and their fingerprints are all over it. So if some of this angers any of you, you can also blame them. Uh, so with the history of US HEMS, like 
Some people can go back to the Prussian War, seeing we used hot air balloons, or not we, but hot air balloons were used to transport patients off the battlefield. But from the US standpoint, aeromedical evacuation really started in World War II. So during World War I, the average time from injury to definitive care was like 12 to 18 hours. Well, during uh, World War II, um, the definitive care ranged from uh, six to nine hours. And this is mainly due to the use of airplanes to evac wounded back uh, from the point of injury. Move up to the Korean War and the mass units were augmented by the utilization of helicopters as air ambulances to evacuate wounded from forward combat areas directly to the surgical units. And it streamlined the trauma system by no longer requiring multiple transportations between the point of injury and definitive care. What this did was this decreased the time even further to like two to four hours uh, from injury to surgical care and mortality got uh, better. Go to the Vietnam War, the mountainous terrain and the combat tactics of the enemy forced further dependence on the helicopter as the primary tool of the pre-hospital arsenal. This further decreased the time to definitive surgical care closer to like one to one and a half hours. What the, the other major change though during Vietnam was they started utilizing highly trained combat medics at the point of wounding which then when you correlated that with the prompt aeromedical evacuation, they saw very high uh, decreases in the uh, battlefield uh, morbidity and mortality rates. We could spend hours talking about the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, but to really sum it up, you saw further evolution in aircraft capabilities and higher trained aeromedical teams, such as uh, you know, the development of the Army Flight Paramedic Program, US Air Force CCAT, the Air Force TACIT programs, UK MERT, uh, the U.S. soft programs, they all were pushing critical care near the point of injury with advanced trauma procedures and blood resuscitation that we've really never seen before. And we had the best morbidity and mortality rates that we'd ever seen in combat. When you go to the civilian sector, uh, HEMS at its simplest definition is an air ambulance that provides critical and sometimes life-saving transport between the site of an accident and a healthcare facility or between two facilities. From, uh, like from trauma alone, the literature would support that utilizing HEMS to transport critically injured patients has improved the likelihood of survival and reduced morbidity and mortality just by having that time factored in. The most commonly cited reasons to use HEMS in the US are one, you have expedited transport to definitive care. Two, it increases access to the tertiary centers. Three, it provides advanced resources such as critical care and specialty care that's not routinely delivered by our ground EMS system. And four is efficiency. A, a HEMS crew can perform more critical care missions in a single shift than a ground EMS crew just by the fact that our transit time is a fraction of what it is by ground. From you know, the 30,000 foot view, approximately two thirds of US HEMS missions today are really in our facility. And what this is, is that we're generally taking critically ill patients from rural centers to the urban tertiary centers, whether it's for trauma or cath labs or stroke centers, ICUs or specialty services. From a, just like a very historical perspective, the first uh, US civilian medevac mission was by the Baltimore State Police in the 70s. The first civilian HEMS program was Flight for Life Colorado in 72. And then like early 19 or early to mid 1980s, you saw about 30 to 40 HEMS programs pop up that have kind of been like the pillars of the agency or of the programs. And uh, they most of them are still in existence. Our program at MedFlight's been around since 1985. So with U.S. programs, there's essentially three types of HEMS programs in the U.S., and they really are defined by who is sending the bill. And this, this really gets into the crux of the, the problems that we face in the agency. But the three things you have to ask yourself with a HEMS program are, one, who owns and operates the aircraft? This means who physically owns the aircraft itself, who supplies the pilot and maintains the aircraft. Number two, who employs, governs, and trains the medical crew? Number three, who bills for the service? So the three most common programs are you have hospital-based programs, you have private equity-owned alternative delivery models, and you have private equity-owned uh, community-based programs. So we'll start with the hospital-based program, and I'll use the University of Squ uh, Wisconsin as an example because it's where I work. But UW employs, it, it governs, and it trains the medical crew, and it provides the EMS licensure for the program. UW then contracts an aviation vendor, in our case, Metro Aviation, to lease the aircraft, to provide the pilots, and to maintain the aircraft. But at the end, UW is the one who bills for service. So from a, a billing standpoint, we're just another entity of UW. So people that are in our network, we're considered in network for the, for the flight portion of their care. When you move next to the private equity-owned alternative delivery models, 
and you ask those same three questions, it's the hospital employs, governs, and trains the medical crew, but the hospital has a contract with the aviation vendor who uh, provides the EMS licensure, the aircraft, the pilot, and the maintenance. The difference, the big difference here is one, the aviation vendor is providing the EMS licensure, but two, the aviation vendor bills for the service. And so the hospital really makes zero net dollars on the transport. It really just relies on downstream revenue that it could generate if they do a transport into their facility. So if they go to hospital X and fly a patient to hospital Y and hospital Y is not their network, they don't. the hospital does not make any money on that flight. The advantages of this is the crews are still trained and governed by the hospital, but and it's it's cheaper for the hospital. Their only overhead is the medical crew. They don't have any of the headaches that come with owning and operating the aviation side of it. The disadvantages uh, are that the bill comes from the avi the aviation vendor, and it's often in line with the bills that you see with the community-based programs, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the fact is, is that the most of the ADMs are out of network. Uh, when you move next to the private, private equity owned community bases, the big thing here is that there's no affiliation with a hospital. The, the aviation vendor, they hire and train the medical crew and everyone from the pilot to the mechanics to the, the med crew work for the vendor. They own the aircraft, they, they provide the maintenance and they bill for service. And they usually end up billing more uh, for their services versus the other two, just to make up for the fact that there is no downstream revenue. Uh, there is like a, a fourth entity, which is public, and that's your state, county, city, municipalities. You can think of like Starflight in Travis County or the Maryland State Police. And typically these programs, are dual, they're dual purpose, they're government funded, and they really do minimal interfacility flights. To put all this in perspective, in the 1980s, more than 98% of HEMS programs were hospital-based. And today, probably less than 30% of HEMS programs are hospital-based. Private equity owns and operates uh, air ambulances. They probably are approaching 70% of the total market in the US. And to parse that out even further, there's really only two private um, uh, uh, private equity firms that really own and operate about 70% of the US industry. To compare this to what our colleagues are doing over in Europe, most other European countries have similar models that um, utilize some manner of physician-based state funding. Uh, the difference is that they don't bill for care and they view pre-hospital care as a continuum of the hospital where they put the value on the quality of care provided. I, I'll talk about the UK just because I was a, a flight physician for London Hems for a year, but the London, the UK services such as London, they don't bill for their services. They operate as a charity and they rely on government funding and private donations uh, for their operations. So the way that would work with London was, Quartz Health NHS Trust provided the flight physician, which is government funded. NHS London Ambulance Service provided the flight from paramedics, which was government funded. And then the charity had to raise the funds through private donations to cover all the operating expenses, the helicopters, the maintenance, the pilots, the equipment, and the train. And what it did was it kind of takes that money piece out of it, and it really focuses more on the quality of care being delivered. When you transition back to the US HEMS industry, this, there's really five problems that are plaguing us today. One is the program structure, which we went up or just went over and you'll see how that plays out in the next couple of slides. But that leads into overexpansion, uncontrolled growth, aviation safety and quality, and then medical safety and quality. To understand this, you just gotta take a, a, a quick step back. So since the beginning of commercial flight, air carriers, whether they're commercial carriers or air cargo, they've been subject to extreme government oversight. So in 1938, the Civil Aeronautics Board had jurisdiction over flight routes, flight schedules, flight times, flight fares, and safety regulations. As you can imagine in the US, this was met with heavy over, this, this heavy oversight was met with increasing criticism as the commercial sector expanded. This resulted in the Airline Deregulation Act, which came into play about around 1978. And what that did was it removed much of the government's control at the federal and state level over the airlines. Essentially what the Deregulation Act does is it preempts state and federal regulations of prices, routes, and services of air carriers. It promotes competition. It promotes new air carriers. It promotes new routes. It essentially creates a market that'll sort, of, sort out the fares and the ability to maintain certain routes. It's really capitalism, the survival of the fittest, with the FAA just maintaining uh, regulation over the safety aspect in the airspace. 
What Mike would tell you is that deregulation really opened the free market to air carriers that led to improved competition and better routes and cheaper prices, and it was hailed as a win for both airlines and the passengers. But why does this matter to us in HEMS? Well, air ambulance providers are considered air carriers under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Department of Transportation. So for us, as a result of the ADA, states or the federal government cannot regulate aspects of HEMS. There's, for charges, there's no limit. Location of bases and service areas, not regulated. What, what type of aircraft, size of aircraft, the safety capabilities of an aircraft that's deemed an air, uh, an air ambulance, very minimal regulations by the FAA. The relationships with EMS and trauma systems are now regulated for HEMS. We do not need a certificate of need. You can essentially put a HEMS base wherever you think it's gonna be profitable. And then when you look at like a medical equipment that defines an air ambulance or like what are the medical crew requirements for education and training, now regulated. So with an open market, it follows that air ambulance organizations have been steadily increasing in recent years with the ability to make money. Unfortunately, the expansion of the organizations has not been geographically balanced. So the Deregulation Act prohibits government intervention in fares and routes. So of the roughly 400 air ambulance operators in the US, the majority of them share around 50% of their geographic catchment area with another air ambulance service. This level of competition, you don't really see it in other aspects of, of emergency services, such as police, fire, and EMS agencies. So while the number of HEMS programs has increased from like 39 in the early 80s to well over 400 programs today with like over 1,200 helicopters, they have really clustered in areas where reimbursement is favorable. It's not related to clinical need of the communities that they service. As a case study, you can, you can just compare Missouri and Wisconsin. So on the surface, their similarities are both roughly 70,000 square miles with 9 million people. If you look at their urban versus rural demographics, they're very similar. But Missouri has 35 helicopters within their state, where Wisconsin has 14 helicopters within our state. Why? It's related to reimbursement and the economics of the state. Missouri is probably a better state for reimbursement for, the, for HEMS. If you look at just Chicago and St. Louis in 2018, Chicago has like 9.5 million people. They had three HEMS bases, which equates to one helicopter roughly per 3 million people. St. Louis has 2.8 million people and they had 15 HEMS bases, which equated to like one helicopter per 185,000 people. Again, Missouri is a, a more favorable state for uh, HEMS. So you can see like the ADA has immensely improved the availability and cost of passenger aviation in the US while maintaining safe operations. But what has the Deregulation Act have to do with the HEMS industry? Talk to Abernathy, talk to other people in, in the industry, they'll tell you that the Deregulation Act has done nothing but increase prices and decrease quality of both the medical care and the aviation quality that we can provide. It was meant to promote consumer choice, but our patients, they don't, they typically don't have a choice. From this chart, you can see that there was exponential growth of helicopters from like 2000 to 2017. This growth was mostly in the, the for-profit sector. What happened? Enter the private equity firms. And then we witnessed a shift from almost 98% hospital-based programs to less than 30% hospital-based programs. Anecdotally, you can look back and then you can also argue that that's maybe where we started seeing a decline in the quality of both aviation safety and the medical care that was being provided by HEMS. From this chart, you can see from the same time period, roughly like 2007 to 2016, we also witnessed a 380% increase in HEMS charges. In reality, the cost of providing HEMS has not increased, just the profit margins have. Why is that? Because of the ADA, uh, with the, I mean, the, the Deregulation Act, there's no regulation on what you can charge. That's because the Deregulation Act bars government intervention in pricing and air ambulance services can charge what they want. So while in the passenger airlines, this comp competition resulted in decreased prices for consumers, there is no free market in an emergency. So patients that are critically ill that are requiring time-sensitive care, they don't have the time or the ability to shop around for the best price. You can't blame the companies, but when there's an opportunity to generate profit, it follows that companies will charge what they want and then resulting downstream in patients fearing air ambulances because of the, the uh, costs that can be associated with them. And while patients often have some form of insurance to help mitigate the cost, 
air ambulances are often deemed out of network. And you can look at a U.S. Government Accountability Office study that showed roughly 70% of insurance carriers in the U.S. do not consider air ambulance flights as out, or they do consider air ambulance flights as out of network. So what does that look like today? Well, the, if you look at the average cost of a hospital-based program versus a private equity program, it's variable, but it's generally two to three times higher uh, if you go with a private equity group. The simple Google search will show you that the median HEMS bill in 2017 was roughly $17,000, but the 90th percentile was well over $50,000. And how do we combat that? Around 2016, Congress mandated the DOT to, to create the uh, Air Ambulance Patient Billing Committee. This was a multidisciplinary committee that examined these very issues over a three-year period, period, and they made numerous recommendations. And the boldest one they made was to separate the U.S. HEMS industry from the Airline Deregulation Act, along with supporting the no-balance billing. What the no-surprise billing or no-balance billing does is it prevents balance billing and out-of-network surcharges. So. If you get a, a HEMS bill for $45,000 and your insurance company says we're only going to pay $10,000 of it, what this is supposed to do is prevent the aviation um, company from coming at you for the remaining $35,000. Unfortunately, this has been stalled because of COVID, so it's still kind of in the, in the works in, in Congress, but we'll see what this does downstream. So does the financial structure of a HEMS program affect aviation safety and quality? Well, quality is not cheap and is not always reimbursed or encouraged. What we can say is the financial structure of a program often determines the type, the age, and the size of, of an aircraft that's used. It affects the safety capabilities of the program. This is things like IFR, autopilots, night vision goggles. It affects simple things like climate control. It affects complicated things like pilot selection and the pilot training. But when you really boil down uh, the safety issues, it comes down to the machines and the people that operate them. And a 2023 study that compared HEMS to ground EMS demonstrated that in, in either transport modality, crashes almost always involve some sort of skill-based error. And the main culprit in most HEMS accidents will point towards either night flights or poor weather conditions as the biggest risk factors. When you look at our fatal accidents, we're doing better than we were. So since 2009, there's been about 31 fatal crashes. This peaked around 2007, 2008 with 11 crashes, fatal crashes in 11 months. But we've now only had one fatal crash in the past three years. Why the decrease in the HEMS accidents? So after that bleak period of 11 crashes in 11 months, in 2009, there was an NTSB summit that made several recommendations for the adoption of several safety technologies that included things like safety management systems, flight recording devices, monitoring flight data, weather forecasting tools, night vision imaging systems, IFR, autopilots, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then around 2015, the FAA started regulating parts of HEMS and they are mandating now that you must have an operations control center, you must have terrain awareness warning systems, you have to have some safety management systems, and you have to have a radar altimeter. So they didn't take all the recommendations. Uh, specifically, they didn't take the requirements for autopilot and IFR ratings or MDG systems, but they took a, enough of them that we're starting to see uh, improvement in HEM safety. Specifically, what is working? When you talk to Abernathy, you know, he would tell you that the biggest difference was made with the operational uh, control center. So what this does is this is a second set of eyes, as, and it's really important for less experienced crews because it reduces the pressure on those crews to fly in adverse weather conditions and it forces them to really slow down, take into account where are they going, what's the terrain, what's the weather doing where they are, what's the weather doing where they're going. It helps avoid inappropriate procedures and it really just forces everybody to take a second look before they accept admissions. So it, it safety, uh, safety culture comes more forward and it's less about always taking the flight to generate the revenue. The other big factor that played into it was MBG. So even though that, that this is not mandated or required, there's about 80, 75 to 80% of the industry is using MBGs and you can correlate that with a significant decrease in nighttime accidents. So the, the biggest factor that remains to talk about are the aircraft. So there, there's a disproportionate number of single engine versus twin engine aircraft, but roughly 60 to 70% of the US HEMS fleet are single engine aircraft. 
It's also ironic that about 70% of the U.S. HEMS fleet would not meet the European Aviation Safety Agency standards. You guys can draw the, do the math, but you can tell me which percentage matches up and which one would meet the safety standards. Why? Do, why? It's because likely because private equity for-profit programs do not want to invest in twin engine aircrafts. So don't misinterpret this as like aircraft are falling out of the sky because of the number of engines. It's often viewed as a surrogate for the overall decision-making surrounding the HEMS program. Cheaper aircraft, cheaper pilots, less pilot training, less medical crew training, all can result in overall poorer decision-making and less experienced crews. Ultimately, single-engine aircraft are just, they're cheaper to purchase, they're cheaper to maintain and operate, and they generally do not have autopilot or many of the other advanced safety features that twin-engine aircrafts do. To put that in perspective, a single engine A star without autopilot is about $1.8 million. This is versus a twin engine EC-145 with all the bells and whistles is around $9 million. Why is autopilot a big deal in this conversation? It's a huge safety feature, especially in single pilot aircrafts. What all autopilots allow them to do is if, if you don't have autopilot, the pilots have to actively be engaged with their feet and their hands to keep the aircraft level at altitude and flying ahead. Of you. Autopilots allow them to essentially take their hands and their feet off the controls for a minute, maintain a safe heading, and then do the other things they have to do like navigation and, and answering radios or if there's a distraction from the flight crew. Why do we care about this? Because 98, 90% of US programs are single pilot. I only know of one dual pilot program in the US. It's really important though, because most fatal HEMS crashes are determined or are ultimately determined by the NTSB to have been the result of human error. And that margin for error is much, much less when there's only one pilot and there's no autopilot to assist them. So does the financial structure of a HEMS program uh, affect the medical quality and safety? I think to answer that, first you have to answer like who determines what constitutes an air ambulance. The FAA determines what the aviation equipment is like terrain warning systems and radar, radar altimeters and navigation systems. And there's like some very minimum medical equipment that is required for a designation as an air ambulance, but it's really very basic requirements, not much beyond a typical passenger aircraft. This individually states can add requirements, but it's very varied uh, across the nation. And if you start looking at each state's EMS acts, the HEMS paragraphs are like, or, or sections are usually one or two paragraphs. And they usually say the following three things. There's something that defines the minimum medical crew licensing requirements. There's a part that'll mandate that the ambulance operates in an FAA approved aircraft, and that the program is usually affiliated with a recognized national accrediting organization. Overall, though, like medical crew requirements and what the capabilities of that are, as far as like, are you medic, medic, nurse, medic, nurse, 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 physician, and like, what are you going to medically provide? For your patients, that's largely determined by individual programs. The states are able to regulate some of the medical aspects, but in reality, each program decides what their model is, what they're going to do, and what they're going to offer for services. The only real hard stop is that to do interfacility HEMS critical care transports, most states do require a nurse on board for billing purposes. So, how does this fit into the bigger picture? Well, competition is good in a market environment, but HEMS is not a market environment. The overexpansion and oversaturation of HEMS programs has led to significantly less experienced pilots and less experienced medical crews. Since the mass expansion in 2000, the average number of HEMS transports per ship per year has decreased by about 50% over that same period. The amount of programs has increased substantially more than the total number of HEMS missions, which is resulting in fewer missions per crew, which means less experience per crew members, both in experience with just the aviation operations and having that critical level of illness in the back of the aircraft. So today, the average HEMS ship is gonna complete about 300 patient transports per year. That's the average. Some programs do more, like the program I'm in, but some do less. You have to think about the programs that are completing less than 200 patient missions per year. That's basically, one transport per week per full-time crew member. To make a, a comparison, think about uh, the level one trauma centers. And it's been published that a level one trauma center that experiences a level two opening in their footprint has resulted in less reps and has had a detrimental effect on the level one's quality of care. It, is, it, it really isn't that different in health. 
The other downstream effect we're noticing has been the dilution of the missions with less critically ill and injured patients. So HEMS is being utilized more and more now for less acute patients due to a shortage of ground critical care trucks. So not only does the average crew get less flights, but the flights they do now they do get are being diluted with less critical patients. So where do we go from here? Well, to move forward, I think you only need to look back at our roots. So life in the ER circa 1970. For the no hairs and the gray hairs on this, you probably remember hearing things like, you don't need to provide real medical care in the ER. You just sort them out. ERs were staffed with the cheapest and least experienced clinicians. They were often ran by interns and rotating staff and even med students. The mantra was the real care is upstairs, where the surgeons and the internists and the ICUs were. And the thought process was that the gateway to real medical care was the elevators that took you upstairs. Fortunately, there were some visionaries that, that realized that there are sick people who cannot wait to get upstairs and that early interventions and procedures save lives, providing a higher level of care, decreased morbidity and mortality. Sick versus not sick isn't usually obvious. That takes training and experience. And just remember, the initial thought of a formal emergency medicine training as a specialty was not well received. Go to Emergency Medicine 2023, and the emergency room has evolved from the pit to a comprehensive 24-hour diagnostic and critical care unit, now known as the Emergency Department. EM is one of 24 recognized medical specialties with uniform accredited three- and four-year training programs, and I would argue that the gateway to real medical care has now been pushed back from the elevator doors to the ambulance bay doors. Pre-hospital medicine's evolution really is not that dissimilar. EMS in 2020 kind of looks like EM in 1970. We started in the 50s where more than 50% of transports were by funeral homes. And you would hear things like, we don't need real medical care in the field. Medicare, Medicare says it's just a transport benefit. You don't need a formal degree. You just need a driver's license and a CPR card. Quality and quantity of education is highly variable. You can't get enough staff, just lower the education requirements. And in some places, EMS is a punitive action or it's a temporary stepping stone until you can get a real job. So from the beginning, EMS has been regulated under the Department of Transportation and it's always been seen as a, trans a transport benefit only. We will only pay you per loaded mile. There's no incentive for quality of care. Other developed countries have evolved EMS systems as CEMS as a continuum of hospital care. The quality of care matters. In the U.S., and this may be my opinion only, but I think many on this would agree, money drives to pre-hospital pre care, and many would argue that the root of all evil is that pre-hospital care is a transportation benefit only. By design, there is no financial incentive for high quality care. The only quality done is because that program or that system wants to do the right thing. There is no financial incentive. As an example, UW MedFlight, we would make more money if we fly a sprained ankle 100 miles versus when we fly an ECMO patient 20 miles because we're paid the same and it's only by loaded mile. So I would say like from 1970 to 2000, the ED mantra was always, let's bring uh, upstairs quality downstairs and that we can all agree, mission accomplished. I would say now as a recognized subspecialty of emergency medicine, it's time for us to bring upstairs quality outside. So how does the flight physician fit into the USM system? Why is it important to have pre-hospital physicians even involved? A couple of points to this, but one, I would say we, we are emergency physicians and we have that additional level of experience and expertise, understanding how to operate both in and outside of the hospital. Then this intimate knowledge of in-hospital care and, and pathways of care often can guide pre-hospital care to inter-facility transfers. Two, and this really comes from Drew and Mike, that opened my eyes to this, but our, the, the HEMS patient population is pre-selected pre to be the sickest patients in the region. And they really do deserve to have that highest level of care driven by physicians, if possible, at the bedside or the roadside. Instead, we choose to take them into the most challenging, low resource environments in between hospitals and give them lesser trained clinicians. Now, I'm not demeaning or undervalu undervaluing our paramedic and nursing colleagues, I started as a flight paramedic and I'm still a paramedic today. I'm also not advocating that all HEMS missions require a flight physician, but in the same breath, in reality, most of us know that not all emergency department patients require physician level management, but we just don't know who and when those patients are gonna show up and what their needs are gonna be. What I argue is that with the flight physician being on board changes is that instead of 
maintaining the care that's already been started before HEMS got there and being reactive to the patient. A flight physician allows us to drive the emergency department level of care at the bedside and be proactive with our care. That kind of leads into a mantra of like competency is the basement of proficiency. What I mean by that is, you know, there's a CAME standard that says five innovations makes you an expert in, in uh, airways. And I can say from my personal experience that I do not believe five innovations on the mannequin best identifies the person to run the hemodynamically unstable RSI or innovate the traumatic airway. Some of the management decisions and interventions we perform are time sensitive. And these patients often need critical care to start at the bedside or the roadside when HEMS arrives not just maintaining what was already started for the next 30 to 60 minutes until they get to the mothership. So instead of extending the golden hour to the definitive care, when you have a, a, a pre-hospital physician on the scene or, or on a helicopter, we really can start the definitive care where the patient is when they need it and streamline the process at the receiving center. What I mean by that is there's some recently published literature that shows like interventions initiated in the emergency department, such as vent settings, antibiotics, pressors, those often continue through the ICU cores. Anecdotally here, I sometimes see if I fly a patient from a rural hospital that didn't even have an emergency physician treating them, if we, you know, the interventions that were started in that ER sometimes do continue through our, our ICU for the first 24 hours of care, and versus if we do some changes with as the flight crew, those changes that we implement carry through for, uh, the ICU for the first, you know, couple hours of care. Point is, is what we do matters and the changes we make at the bedside or the roadside actually can affect the downstream effect for your patients. From the EMS trained specialist side, like we're all on this at some level of an EMS medical director and we're all pretty good at the administrative side of our specialty as far as QA, QI protocols and training. What I'm arguing is that for HEMS, we need to become excellent pre-hospital clinicians. So going forward, how do we advocate for this kind of system change? I think. There's three, there's three pieces to this. One is that we need to own being free hospital clinicians and somewhat follow what the European model was doing with him. So in the US model, in my definition, there's three pieces of a pre hospitalist One, you're trained in emergency medicine. And uh, I think that's the best specialty for this because you have a breadth of knowledge that best suits transporting undifferentiated injured or ill patients. We have the critical care experience and we have procedural proficiency. Uh, the second piece is experience and specific training in pre-hospital medicine, whether that's an EMS fellowship or a prior EMS experience or military experience or some combination of it. What I, you, you need to know how to be outside the hospital. And then the third part, and this is probably the hardest part to get at in our, in our system right now, is you need to be an integrated team member of an organization that provides pre-hospital care on a regular basis, i.e. you need to establish a pre-hospital clinical practice. That is easier said than done. Budgets are a real thing. FTEs are a real thing. EMS is political, and it's it's not always good, going to, to be an easy, easy lift. You know, I, I also recognize that I've had an experience with San Antonio and the military and now UW, where pre-hospital physicians were, were embraced and recognized, and it was encouraged for us to have pre-hospital practice, and that's not the way it is throughout the country, but that's why we have advocacy groups like AEM, and that's one of the lists I think we need to start looking at is how do we establish those practices? The flip side, I can also say that I've never personally worked for an emergency department medical director or a department chair who was not clinically active in emergency medicine. So you, I don't know why it should be different in EMS. The other big piece is, is financial investments that need to be made into pre-hospital care. And I, you know, I've listened to talks by Mark Escott and other people in the EMS world, and I agree 100% with everything they're saying, I don't know how to answer the, the changes from a transport benefit to a medical benefit. But I think ideally that starts at the federal or the state levels to attain funding to ensure we're hiring and retaining quality people to provide quality care. It probably starts with moving EMS out of the DOT and into something that's more appropriate like HHS. Um, some would argue that there's downstream effects that can show value where more aggressive and physician-like care early on in pre-hospital courses can also significantly impact downstream costs such as decreasing ICU days or minimizing complications from misadventures in anesthesia or poor event management or a plethora of things that we see daily in EMS that 
more training and SIMS just isn't going to replace the fact that we are medical school residency and fellowship trained. Like that's the training pipeline for that level of care. And then the last piece I would say is that we just need to embrace that we are value added in the way that the, the European models are, that these are the sickest patients. We're often taking them to our colleagues and tertiary centers. Why not start the physician-led care sooner? Pre-hospital medicine is a continuum. It's not a transport benefit. HEMS is just a different vehicle with the ability to provide a higher level of clinical care. Pre-hospital physicians, in my opinion, are, are uniquely trained to balance the medicine that's provided in the big house and the, with the realities of practicing medicine on the street or when we go into these smaller resource limited community hospitals or critical access hospitals. My final point is just to remember that there was a time in the house of medicine when the idea of EM as a recognized specialty was laughable and now we are society's safety net. So with that, I will turn it back to Brian and take any questions or comments. And thank you so much. Uh, oh, no thank you so much, uh, Ryan. That was uh, a fantastic presentation. Really can cover some of the uh, difficulties, but where we can actually head and, and improve uh, the practice of pre-hospital medicine and, and how HEMS plays an incredible role into this. Um, I'm going to turn it over to some of the uh, uh, participants to go ahead and ask some questions. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, the first one. Uh, if you'll come up on the uh, video and, and so you guys can interact, uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Harper. Hey, Ryan, that was uh, absolutely great. As always, uh, love hearing from you. You got good stuff going on. I was kind of curious, as the, um, the HEMS guy that you are now, how much of your care and decision making occurs in the transporting hospital rather than in the helicopter? Like, basically, how much would you say on a percentage is optimizing uh, the patient for the flight rather than making adjustments and doing interventions in flight? Uh, I think it's a really good question, Steve. Like, I, I would go by with what I learned in London and what I learned in UK is. Pre-flight optimization is really the key. There's a lot of things that you just don't want to be doing at, at altitude. So, you know, like with MedFlight, like we really try to, if we're going to innovate them, we innovate them before we go. We get them ideally on our transport vent and dialed in on our settings the way we want before we go. We make all of our medication decisions and stuff before we go. But sometimes just things happen in flight and you have to act like, you know, you take that trauma patient and it's a 30 minute flight to the trauma center and they didn't have attention when we left and they didn't have it on our ultrasound, but in flight, something changes and you have to react and do the procedure or vent management decisions with the arts patients and some of our critically ill patients, they occur in flight. But what I took from, from the guys in London and the UK Mert was the better you pre-plan and the more you do before you lift, the more smooth the flight is and the less complications you have in route. Awesome, thank you. Uh, are there any more questions out there right now? Hey Ryan, it's Catherine. Um, that was a great presentation and great to see you as well. Um, I just wanted to ask you to comment or clarify a little bit. You mentioned the crashes, the fatal crashes kind of declining recently and it makes sense um, why that is. But um, I personally feel like just over the last few weeks to months, I've seen several medical helicopter crashes um, with fatalities. Um, do you recall like reading about those and, and what are your thoughts on kind of what happened with those last few? Uh, the last few, I don't, I don't know the details any more than anybody else probably does uh, from what they saw in the news. But I think if they follow the trends that we've seen in the past, it's probably going to be related to critical decision making. And, you know, like if you just look at the stats, you'd have to look to see were they single engine, were they twin engine aircraft? What was the weather conditions? What was, was it daytime? Was it nighttime? What were they doing? Where were they going? And I think those details will come out down the road after they do the investigations. Um, a good person. Ryan, hey, Ryan, it's CJ. I, I don't think those were helicopters. I, 
I'm not sure though. So the one was uh, was fixed wing. Yeah, this, this, yeah, this is Abernathy. So the the last, it's interesting. Uh, there have been uh, two fatal fixed wing class crashes. It's the same private equity owned Guardian Air. Uh, there was a crash 11 weeks ago in Hawaii, and then the one just a couple of days ago in um, Nevada. And these were both fixed wing airplane crashes. And, it, and it's odd, everything sort of flipped because before, you know, these were a rarity. We weren't hearing about these and the helicopters were going down all the time. But now it seems in the last three years, we've had, I can think of four fatal fixed wing crashes and uh, one uh, helicopter. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you backing me up, brother. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't think I um, had noticed that detail, which obviously is a huge detail, but <laughs> but that's another interesting topic as well regarding the, the fixed wing aircraft. But thank you. I appreciate the answer. Ryan, while we're on that, I think that might be a good segue for you to teach me what the difference between helicopter and, and fixed wing are. Uh, what are you... What are you so I assume fixed... I mean, how about this? Why do I need a helicopter or a fixed wing? The distance. So, you know, your fixed wing, is, it's an airplane. So if you are like a super specialty center, let's say like the Mayo Clinic and you're flying patients from all over the country, I can get you from California to Mayo in hours versus days by ground and probably days by helicopter with multiple fuel stops. So fixed wing is really the advantage is large geographic coverage. Um, HEMS, you know, we usually stay within a roughly like a two hour footprint of where we operate. And that's just because of what we're limited by fuel and weight. Um, the advantage for HEMS versus fixed wings, fixed wings need an airport. You have to land at an airport and then you have to have a way to get the patient off the airplane uh, to and from where they're going. Helicopters, we can land pretty much where we want as long as it's a safe LZ, but we don't need to necessarily have an airport and we can have you pull your ambulance up to us or we can land at your helicopter, your hospital and then land at our destination hospital. So the differences are really more geography that you're covering and what's required to get the patient on and off your aircraft. And fixed wings gonna be more expensive and I think some distance because of the amount of time and um, geography you're covering. Do they generally have the same um, clinical personnel on them? You know, CJ, I'm going to be very, very honest with you. Like, we don't do fixed wing where I'm at. I've never been with fixed wing. You can probably talk to Rachel and the guys at the Air Force that do fixed wing on a, a regular basis. But I, you know, I, I really don't know how to answer that question because I have very limited experience with fixed wing. So I, I really don't know the answer to that. I think it is interesting, though, that like the lay person, like I'm pretty much a lay person when it comes to helicopter or fixed wing. Right. Like, I think the lay person is like, oh, if there's a wreck in the air, then it's just all the same. Right. Like it's not, you know, not saying that's what Dr. Ratchik is saying, but I'm just saying like the perception to to the the public is like, well, it's in the air. It must be just the same. And, you know, I, I kind of have that perception, too, but obviously it's not. Yeah, and it's interesting, CJ. So there's a, a study that just came out this year that they actually compared HEMS to ground EMS crashes. And right now you're more likely to be in a ground EMS crash than a HEMS crash. And yes, the HEMS crashes are a little bit, they have a higher fatality rate just because we're falling out of the sky at a high rate of speed. But you're more likely to be in a ground EMS crash right now, like 11, by 11 times more likely, and you're seven times more likely to be injured in a ground EMS crash versus a HEMS crash. And why? I just think it's because the FAA is starting to pay attention with all the safety uh, for our operations. So Ryan, let me ask you a question, kind of put you on the spot real quick. Um, you know, you showed a great uh, uh, picture of the United States and, and all the um, HEMS available resources. And, and what I noticed and stood out to me was uh, the east side of the country seems to be very um, well saturated. Um, but these these areas tend to be highly populated and around not so not, you know, they aren't needing critical access as much as 
uh, more towards the West. I mean, here in Texas, uh, as soon as you leave San Antonio, you don't run into simulation again for six or seven hours. Uh, we depend on helicopters to access these critical care hospitals. My, my question is, is how do you think we best advocate as system uh, advocates, as, as uh, medical directors and EMS physicians, to better resource manage this? Do we, do we advocate for resource allocation and, and regulation, or do we advocate for subsidy uh, to provide uh, uh, coverage in these high utilization areas that would benefit from this, this uh, transport modality? You know, that's a really good question, Brian. And like, I'll give you like my like one second spiel, but if, if Amber and Anthony's still on, like this is becoming more of a conversation, which is what it really should be right now. And Mike is an expert in this. Like he's testified in Congress for this, but you know, I would argue the value of HEMS is not in your major urban areas. Like, like look at Chicago, there's a trauma center on every street corner and everybody's critical care. Or, or even like where we operate in Madison, like we aren't landing our aircraft within Madison. We're going... 30 minutes to two hours outside and bringing patients that are in the rural places to the tertiary centers. And I think something like 80% of the country is considered rural. How you get there, uh, I think it's going to be a balance of like federal and state uh, regulations and some sort of government funding or finding a way to make it profitable for physicians to be on the aircraft. But Mike, do you, Mike, are you still on? Yeah, I'm here. What do you what do you think about that? Because I haven't really thought about yeah, it. Yeah, you know, so we need less helicopters. The problem is we have twelve hundred helicopters. Again, the majority of those in grossly oversaturated areas. You know, the GAO did a study and they looked at all the new helicopter programs in the last ten years, were two thousand twelve to two thousand twenty, and they found that the vast majority of these helicopters were going into areas of existing service. So they're not going out in these rural areas that really need it. Uh, you know, there's such oversaturation. If we could, you know, because there's everybody, you know, there's an average of 300 flights per year per ship. You know, there's a lot of room there. So if, you know, my solution is, you know, we need to get rid of three or 400 helicopters and, you know, position them and the remainder of those would be quite busy which would be great for the medical quality, the aviation quality, the more you do something, the better you get at it. And you would make more money, it would become somewhat more profitable for the good programs, rather than you just sort of divvy up this pie a thousand different ways. So that was our thing. If it, you know, in this committee, I sat on uh, the DOT committee, uh, you know, if we peel the helicopter emergency medical services away from the um, ADA, the Airline Deregulation Act, all of a sudden the states could say, you know what? No, we've got enough helicopters here. Or if you want to put a helicopter, this is an area of the state that needs it rather than there's places, swear to God, on the East Coast in Pennsylvania, Ohio, where you have three competing programs sitting at the same damn airport and none of them are doing a, you know, a business. So, you know, I really think it comes down to the Airline Deregulation Act, and that will help put the market back into it, but it would put some common sense into it also. Um, do you guys feel that, um, uh, what, what would you describe as the ideal pathway for a, uh, you know, one of our medical students or residents, they're really interested in being that pre-hospital clinician. What is, what is the kind of career path that you uh, recommend they kind of move through? Uh, I think it's, you know, I, I, it's the one I actually laid out where I think one is first, you need to be uh, get, you know, through emergency medicine residency and be a really good emergency medicine clinician and be, become an expert at the undifferentiated patient and being confident in your ability to see sick versus not sick and recognize critical illness and be proficient in your, your critical skills. From there, I would look at, you know, how do you get into the pre-hospital arena, whether you had it prior in a prior life because you were 
in EMS or you do an EMS fellowship or a critical care fellowship or something along that lines that gives you another tool set. And then three, you need to get with an agency and actually do the job and be out there and understand like what is pre-hospital medicine and, and understand that you need to be almost, in my opinion, you sometimes need to be a better ER physician uh, to do pre-hospital medicine because you have to be a very good um, clinician as far as like, you don't have a CT scan or a chest X-ray in front of you. Like you might have some basic point of care labs. Like uh, I don't even tell you last time I pulled our EPOC out, but I do use our handheld ultrasound, but you know, you have less resources, you have less data to make critical decisions. So I would say one, be a, become a very good ER physician, two, do a pre-hospital fellowship somewhere, and then three, work pre-hospital medicine some way, whether it's ground, whether it's HEMS, whether it's it's both. Um, and, and, you know, find your niche and develop. I think the best advice I got early in my residency training was in emergency medicine, you the breadth is so wide, you cannot be an expert in all of it, and you cannot be perfect in all of it. So find something you love, find something that you will want to be uh, an expert in that you don't see as work and own it. And then, you know, you work in the ER to pay your mortgage. Dr. Harper has a question. Yeah, um, Ryan, at the risk of having a conflict of interest, um, do you recommend that any prospective residents and fellows do the EMS fellowship in San Antonio with San Antonio Fire Department? I do recommend that they do that fellowship. Most excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I recommend it too. So that's great. So, yes, I would, you know, like I can say this now because I'm not a really like, there anymore, but like, I do think one of the major advantages for that program is, you know, like when we were talking about free hospital care, it's a continuum of care. And, you know, I've been fortunate both at UW and San Antonio, where I was in a place where they allowed you to develop a, pre, a, a pre-hospital clinical practice. People like Winkler and Miramontes and the San Antonio Fire Department are allowing that to occur where you really get to do more than just write protocols and answer the radio and do QAQI. You have unfettered access to the ambulances, to the MOFs, to the physician response vehicle, and you really can develop a, a practice there. And there's other places in the country that are like that. Like San Antonio isn't the only one, but I have personal experience with them where I would vet and say, yes, they are one of the better places to go, in my opinion. But UW, we have an EMS fellowship and they have unfettered access to Madison Fire, and then we have a physician response vehicle. And this is an equally good place from what I've seen in my short time here to do it. We have a HEMS fellowship here where it's not ACGM accredited, but if you want experience in HEMS, you can graduate EM and we'll happily look at you to come spend a year with us and be a, a HEMS flight physician where we'll give you a lot of the, you'll work clinically as a HEMS flight doc and we'll give you all the training uh, during your fellowship on how to deal with like ECMO and EPO, I think is what I was learning today and, and all the other stuff that comes with a HEMS fellowship. So my point is, is there's lots of fellowships out there, you know, find a place that you're comfortable with, but if you can find the fellowships that are gonna encourage you to be able to get out of the office and be on the street, I would recommend those uh, over other ones. Is that a fair answer, Steve? I think that's a great answer um, and exactly what I'm looking for. because tons of EMS fellowships out there now, but they're all very different, right? Like there's going to be a different percentage of the amount of time that you can spend in the field versus the amount of time that you might have experience with flight versus, hey, you're just going to be a protocol writer in a uh, QA, QI junkie, which all of those are important and they're all very important for an EMS physician. But if you want to be the practicing EMS physician out in the field, you need to find the niche where they're going to let you do that. Not all fellowships will let you do that. So there's some out there that are really good at doing that and there's some that aren't. Yep. You know, I would tell people like when they're, you know, when you interview for fellowship, like you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you and ask that question, like how much time do I get to, is protected for me to get out there, whether it's on ambulances or in helicopters or uh, on a physician response vehicle, but like ask the question and see, see what kind of answer you get.
All right. Well, it's now uh, eight o'clock. Uh, we'll kind of go off here in a, in a second, if it, unless there's any last minute questions. I think uh, Dr. Massimico has a, a question. Yes, I do. Hey, sir. Good to see you again. Yeah. I'm going to ask, ask my standard question. EMS medical direction versus EMS physician, two different skill sets. Should they be both in an EMS fellowship? How do you train for one versus the other? I think that's always a question on my mind because what you're describing is more aimed at an EMS clinician as opposed to medical director. Yeah. So again, I think it's, it's a really good point. I think like what you are getting in San Antonio and what we're building up here, building on up here at UW is the balance of, of both. So yes, you, to be an EMS medical director, you have to do all those things that Miramontes does so well every day. Like you have to know how the laws work, how the regulations work, how to QA, QI, how to do all the administrative stuff. On the flip side, you know, like riding out with the ambulances and being in the field is equally important. So with like, for example, our HEMS fellowship at UW, like it's a balance where clinically our fellows work uh, shifts as a, as a fellow. So it's indirect uh, supervision, but they are on the helicopter with the flight nurse doing what they do, building their clinical practice. But then on the fellowship side, like their didactics and stuff, that's where we're teaching, hey, this is how you QA, QI. This is how you write protocols. This is what the part 135 is. This is how billing works. So we're teaching the administrative side and didactics. And then they're going to the committee meetings and doing all that stuff. But we've carved out the, the clinical piece to say, you're going to fly four to six, 24 hour shifts a month to build your clinical skill set. So I do think you can balance both. It's just a matter of whether the program wants to balance both. Good answer, sir. Thanks, yeah. All right. Well, I hope this was very informative to everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ryan, for taking the time to uh, teach us about HEMS, the uh, challenges that we face as uh, EMS physicians moving forward, uh, and also how we advocate for uh, having the most trained provider uh, there at the patient's side at a critical care hospital, starting that uh, diagnostic um, uh, momentum, moving that patient forward through the system, improving their quality, uh, improving their life savings. So uh, thank you all for uh, participating. I have to throw out there, uh, we will be having the scientific assembly uh, in the uh, very fun uh, city, which I've never been to. I'm looking so much forward to it, New Orleans. Uh, it's going to be April 21st through 25th. If you haven't uh, registered, please go to aem.org uh, slash aem2023. Um, we're going to be having an EMS meeting uh, on the 23rd of that day uh, at 4 p.m., uh, just be a very informal kind of meet and greet, get together, talk about some of the issues, talk about some of the plans. Uh, we're going to keep this web webinar series moving forward uh, in the next quarter. Uh, so look forward to that coming out. And uh, thank you guys all for uh, meeting. Uh, we will be having another uh, section meeting very soon uh, and we'll hopefully move in uh, with the new uh, councils and uh, uh, leadership uh, so I encourage everybody to please watch out for my AM uh, when to join that. Thank you again. Uh, really appreciate everybody hopping on tonight. And this uh, will be uploaded to YouTube so you can watch it at a later date. Thank you.